I do think that's an interesting question. Like, say, I was very clear when I was putting this talk, because the um, because when I was thinking about this in terms of structuring the talk, like there's two principal costs, and I think this is really why I wanted Adrian to go first to give some context to this, because uh, I think my talk very much takes out a uh, microscope to one part of this, and I think it's useful to understand the big context of the problem. Um, so I'm focusing on the, 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 the in FWI, it's, it's quite a cool problem to work on research-wise because it's a nice big chunky problem. And I think when people talk about big data and then they're talking about Twitter feeds, like I think it sort of costs the small because this is a genuine big data problem. It's, it's massively computationally intensive, so it's HPC in that regard. Um, but then it's genuine big data, like it's running into petabytes and 18 months is expected to go up to 10 petabytes for like, you know, the, in terms of the largest type surveys. Uh, and I think this type of question about the checkpoint and then I think is very pertinent because like say, I think some of the strategies you were talking about going forwards and backwards and like the recomputing forwards, like these, these largely were developed, I think, in uh, like in the 1990s. Yeah, like say when there was very limited space, and that was the reality that we were living in technology in that in that period in time. But today, when like they're going towards SSD and better fabric for integrating these things, you're looking at an area where there's a lot more memory available, and even like the transition from Hadoop to Spark, like people are shifting away from disk to ha starting to be able to grow systems with sufficiently large memory that you can store more. Precisely. So I think it's always useful. Um, I, I think, uh, and like that, I think th I've not gone completely off topic. I, I think, from a philosophical point of view, I think this is why you always have to nearly reassess where you are, uh, because technology is not just algorithms are like getting better as people doing research, but the technology is also shifting, and the optimal thing to do is always shifting. So you you nearly have to be in a permanent state of uh, looking at what you're doing. And, and, and reassessing it, uh, and I say, okay, if this was the right thing to do yesterday, is it still true today? Um, but getting back on, uh, getting back onto the subject of the actual talk, then. Um, so, as Adrian pointed out in his introduction, given the structure, I hope that you uh, can see then the vast, uh, the, the the vast amount of the computation is just in implementing the finite difference uh, solver. Um, so it's either the forwards or the backwards and a few other like stencil type operators. Uh, and this is pretty much all your computational cost, like all the rest of the stuff. Like excluding I.O., which is a whole thing by itself, uh, excluding that, your cost is uh, just uh, performing those stencil operators. Um, so my background like, is uh, like uh, physics. I, I sort of bounced between uh, physics and computer science and HPC camps. Um, so like you know, Hamish and Mike were good enough to get me interested in this problem last year. And then this was a project that's uh, funded by Intel with the Intel Parallel Computing Centers. And it's with uh, Sinai Cinetech there and their HPC Center. So we're working together very closely on this problem. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. I think we're making uh, some progress in it. And what we're, what largely what we're trying to do as well is like reimagine things to a certain extent, see, OK, what new technologies are available? How can we do this better? What are the interesting challenges? And uh, hopefully then we have something interesting to offer back to the community. Um, so as you can see, I've listed everyone's names there. I think I've listed all the people that have contributed to this in some way. Um, and and our, one of the things to remember here then, and I think this will become more clear as I go through the talk, but like some of these people are mathematicians, some of these people are computer scientists, and some people are geophysicists or physicists, and really you need all of these people to be working together um, to really move this pro problem forward. Um, so as I was uh, highlighting there, like it's inherently uh, computationally compute intensive, um, so that's why we do need to, to to focus some of our research on this. The dominant cost, of course, is running the wave model. Um, so that, like there's a few more steps. You have the backward sweep as well, and some other operators, but you're still applying a, a, like a stencil type operator. So the same type of optimizations apply in both cases. Um, so typically, like it's the, the what people are using is some type of acoustic equation with various modifications to take into account various anisotropic features. So there's more details there. And I guess the reason why I'm sort of highlighting that as well is you always have to remember, yeah, I could optimize it, but then I have to optimize all my code again and again and again every time someone makes an adjustment to their equation uh, and, and indeed change um, uh, to a different architecture. And, and one of the reasons it's becoming um, pretty pressing as well, like is because like people would like to be able to do this, uh, to do inversion with Elastic. Now that's that's got to be really really complicated, okay? Because suddenly from the uh, from an inversion perspective, 
as Mike points out, you have a lot more parameters to suddenly start inverting for. And that's an open problem, and it's going to be a really difficult problem to be solved. Um, but at the same time, you, you want to be able to solve that problem, and you don't want to have to deal with the fact uh, that the elastic equation becomes too difficult to solve, which I'll get into now. Um, so I'm going to list out three challenges that we have to sort of deal with and then have a strategy of dealing with all of these three together in some way. And hopefully if we do this right and choose the right strategy, then we can try to solve all three of these challenges simultaneously. Um, so the first one that I was starting off there is uh, the elastic wa wave equation. So leaving aside again the fact that there's an open question about how you actually invert for all these additional parameters, uh, the fact is that you're now you're modeling um, S waves. So a bit, a bit of hand waving here now. So your, your S waves be traveling at roughly uh, half the speed of the P waves. So now you've got half the wavelength. So suddenly you need to double the, the grid resolution in all three dimensions. So suddenly you've got a factor of eight increase in terms of the size of your model. And then that is half. Now you also have to maintain your CFL condition. So that means you need to half your time steps. So you've doubled your time steps. And um, so right off the bat, you have at least a factor of 16 times more expensive uh, to run this model. Um, and, and that's probably the optimistic version um, because if you have, um, like depending on what the media is, uh, then the wavelengths might be much shorter, in which case you have to, like you know, some parts of the domain at least, might need many, many more time steps and the cost goes ev up even further. Um, so pretty much the take home message here is that uh, like uh, already an expensive problem becomes many, many more times expensive. So like today, uh, today already doing uh, FWI because of the compute aspect, it's amazingly expensive. This is why like I think the oil and gas industry for this one application, like th these are the largest supercomputers in the private sector. Like so it's th th this gives you an idea of exactly how big this problem is. And we're talking about making it many, many more times more expensive. So um, we have some work to do. Um, but then it's always worth uh, remembering that, uh, that there's also different numerical discretizations. Um, so very often, and I think this is where you have to be a bit aware as well, like very often if you just get your code, like if you have your code and you just hand it over to the Intel engineers or pure CS person and say, okay, go and make it go faster. Like, uh, like at best, you might get a factor of two speed up. Like, you know, if you're really optimistic, like, you know, that'd be amazing. Like, you know, like already they start publishing papers at conferences when they get 10% 10 10 speed up from uh, what type of tweaks they've done in the code. Um, so I, I hope you understand from the previous slide is like even doubling the speed of the code doesn't cut it. That's not good enough. It has to be many, many times uh, faster. And we have to figure out how to do that. And typically, when you want to have that kind of a speed up, then you have to start changing your numerics. Um, so I know there's quite a lot of literature published um, al already in, in, in the seismic literature. And particularly, what they look at is increasing the order. So the, the, the standard way of dealing with this is uh, increase uh, the order of your discretization. And as you increase the order of your discretization, uh, this allows you to have fewer grid points. So suddenly, then you start being able to take larger time steps, uh, time steps again, and and you have like a small, you're using up less memory now as well because uh, because you're exploiting higher order. And there's lots of good papers then, like you know, that actually shows you the relationship between these two things. As you increase the order, your costs going down and your memory going down. So that's well understood. Um, but as I say, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, like as that's happening, like the question is, why doesn't everyone do it? If that's the right answer, well, it's because uh, like just implementing this becomes uh, extremely complex. You start, you quickly start uh, generating these very, very large uh, expressions. They're very difficult to work out. They're and they're problematic to implement, and they're even more difficult then to optimize. Um, so we're getting into the what I wanted to listen as the third challenge. Um, so this is typically then where you're just focusing on, well, how do we implement it? So the fact is that hardware is following uh, Moore's law. The only problem is we have to work much, much harder when we're writing code to implement it. Uh, and, and this is a problem, right? Uh, because like say in the community, both in research and uh, like in industry, uh, like you have a bunch of geophysicists to solve um, the FWI problem and to work on these open questions about how you invert for all these parameters efficiently and solve this very difficult problem. And increasingly, you're having to spend more and more investment, and they're spending the more, more and more time 
uh, implementing very sort of low level stuff got to do with a finite difference propagator. Like that's really not where the effort should go into uh, for those people. Uh, and like, because you have to do all kinds of stuff. Like you have to exploit parallelism at all levels, uh, doing stuff that you never had to do before. Uh, I'd like to say threads is only the start. You have to, do to deal, uh, work harder to deal with the deep memory hierarchy. Data locality becomes uh, crucially important. You have to do uh, same D vectorization, like particularly when you start talking about other processors, uh, modern processors like um, like Phi. Uh, you, you have to be you have to be making use of those large vectors, uh, and uh, it's likely to get even more uh, exotic, like looking at heterogeneous. But even if you're a particular contractor or if you're a research, you might have one cluster that's got GPUs. You'll have another one that's got Phi. You might have something else like FPGAs or something if you're uh, gone really crazy. And then you're trying to say, oh, well, I'm going to need this one team of postdocs to implement, to rewrite all my code for CUDA and then someone else to, uh, to target uh, x86 or something else. So quickly, this starts getting out of hand. And you're, you're, not going to be able to, you're not going to be able to hire a number of people that have their appropriate skills to do, implement all this stuff. So I think even at the top level in terms of management, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real problem. Uh, like we have CUDA now, but goodness knows what we have. Everyone tells us, oh, now you have to do it in OpenCL. And you pretty much hear about a new pro parallel programming paradigm every year when you go to the next conference. Everyone tells you, oh, rewrite your code again. Like, obviously, that's not going to happen. We can't keep doing that. Um, and there's also, also other issues. The f fact of the matter is the hardware is changing, uh, whether we like it or not. And uh, one of the lessons that's, that's arising from this is that we actually might have to start changing our numerical algorithm or else it's just not going to work on that particular architecture. Stuff that was OK to do in the 90s becomes no longer like possible to do today or not efficient to do. It's actually better just to switch your numerical algorithm. Um, so one trend then that we are focused on quite a bit here is exploiting uh, domain-specific languages. So one way that we could try and do with this, we could say, okay, well, it's a real problem, uh, like you know, having to write this bespoke code for each new processor that comes along the way. Uh, I, I, I think particularly if you're developing a code then for the community, like different people want to use your code, they might have entirely different hardware. Um, so how can you insulate yourself from that? You still want to develop code and still be able to run it on all of this. And one way is have to ha use the main specific languages so that you, the geophysicist or like person working out your optimization algorithms, can write your, um, can write your algorithms at a much higher layer of abstraction and then not care about how does that actually translate into source code that's going to run on whichever uh, processor comes out next year. And I guess this is largely what I get across, is that what we have to recognize is always, when, some, when a task becomes repetitive and it becomes tedious, and uh, like, you know, because a, a lot of the issues, they're fairly straightforward, we know them, it's just tedious to do it, uh, well, then normally we mechanize it, okay? So, like, no more, like you know, we win from uh, a side out in the field, like, you, know, you just have to keep going doing this all day. It's not too different from implementing a, a lot of finite difference codes into we automated it, like we had the industrial revolution, <laughs> we me mechanicized the whole thing, and then we can do a lot more work, um, a lot more quickly. Of course, some people don't like that, okay? So I think this is one of the challenges we had for ourselves, like I, I think you always have to be, this is one of the reasons you always have to challenge yourself and challenge your assumptions, and always remember, yeah, well, I quite like doing that, can I not keep doing that? Uh, but like, you know, quickly, if technology is moving on, behind, uh, moving on, you have to sort of keep up, keep up in some way. Um, and, and this is the interesting thing. There's actually, like this could be one of the largest research areas that you've never heard of. There's actually a, a massive, um, there's a, there's a massive uh, research community already focused on Stinson languages. So they, so like finite difference, like can be, like fall into the category of a Stinson language, just means it has this regular pattern. And it's actually uh, a, big area of, a big area of interest for lots of different fields, like image processing and all the rest. Um, and and, like, and it, it, takes a, it takes a lot of interest from compiler groups in computer science uh, for lots of different applications. Um, so they even have their own, like, they have their own conferences 
Uh, like particularly with exascale as well, there's renewed interest in this because people are more obsessing now about, well, what do we do in the exascale era? Uh, this is going to cause a big problem for everyone else. So people have started having uh, uh, like a, a lot more research into this for how you can like you know, d develop technologies to, to uh, implement uh, efficient code for these things. Uh, and there's already quite a lot of say, complete compilers out there for writing out code for, for the uh, Xeon, say, threaded code, GPUs, and FPGAs. Um, I, I've listed out a few examples uh, just in case you want to do some Googling so you could have a quick look. So I think this, this website is actually quite good. This is quite a large uh, research project uh, where they're researching different techniques uh, and where they're getting a lot of the CS compiler community to get in and implement stuff and talk about ideas find the most efficient way of doing these things. And um, just in, in, in terms of terminology, because it, it, I think it does get confusing, I think if you're not a specialist in this, like uh, th this comes up quite a lot when they talk about polyhedral compilers, and really all this translates to, like, you know, to, like, people that program Fortran and whatnot, it's just a nested loop. So when they talk about polyhedral compilers, these are compilers that are designed to optimize, um, to optimize uh, nested loops and to do that in a really perfect way. So you probably heard of people doing tiling and unrolling and unroll jam and all these types of techniques. Well, that actually all just fits inside like the area of uh, polyhedral compilers. So what you want to do then is rather than doing all of that hard work that people still go to conferences and report about and all the rest, oh, I did this and I implemented this by hand, well, then you're going to use tools that are going to do this all automatically for you. Um, uh, but, but then, uh, like, I put up this slide then as a bit of a, wor like, par partly to reflect our experience and partly as a bit of a wor word of warning as well. Like, you can't walk in to start using DS and be too naive about it. I think it's like an any time someone comes and tells you, oh, this is, this is panacea, this is going to solve all of your problems. Um, like, well, then you know they're going to be wrong, they're overselling it. There's a problem with everything. You're, you're, you're never going to get it perfect. And the th so when we start, when we actually proposed this project originally, and got it going. Um, like Porsche was a DSL that we said, oh, we were going to use this for doing this problem. It, like it seemed perfect. The, yeah, like it was a project that was funded by Intel. They published lots of papers. They're at all these conferences. It looked absolutely wonderful, and the results were really good. And generated cache oblivious silk code. And uh, like I said, this trap algorithm is a really fancy algorithm where it's not just um, like doing tiling in space but it was also doing uh, this extrusion in time as well. So you'd march forwards in time and keep things in cache. And like, you'd get really amazing performance. And it was generating the code. So like, things like trap, if you were to try and optimize it to write this by hand, it's an awful lot of code, an awful lot of really complicated code. But once again, you just generate it automatically. It's all done. You get very fast code. Everything is happy. Um, so we said, great, fantastic. We'll start using this. And, uh, and almost immediately when we had tried to apply it to a real problem that was actually interested to the seismic community, it wouldn't work anymore just because the, 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 the DSL, the abstraction that they used was too restrictive. So right away we had problems. We couldn't implement uh, boundary conditions um, because of the independency between fields. Uh, it wasn't easy. Well, we couldn't at all use a trap algorithm for coupled, uh, for uh, coupling linear equations, say if you're doing uh, velocity stress uh, formulation, for example. And um, so it, it, like it completely broke down and it's next to useless. So what's the lesson here? Well, the, the, the lesson is that like you always have to remember, well, a lot of these things are developed inside the CS community where they're taking uh, an idealized problem that just happens to work for the, for the problem they're interested in. Uh, it's not necessarily going to work for our problem because we're doing you know, real world, there's lots of hacks that need to go in, our engineering considerations that need to go into the code, or the particular, we have to have uh, a couple of equations and lots of these other complications. Uh, but that doesn't mean that DSLs are rubbish. It just means that, um, number one, don't expect it to do everything magically. Uh, but also, when we were designing our framework, so I'll get into the details now of what we did design, but when you design the framework, then you always have to make sure that there's an escape hatch. So what you try to do is, as much as possible, you try to do everything through the, uh, the automated framework, so it's doing all of the hard work for you, and everything's nice, uh, nice abstractions, and everything becomes very easy. But you always need to guarantee in your framework that 
when it fails for whatever reason, because like you know, someone has got a, a, a novel requirement that wasn't taken into account when you designed this thing in the first place, you want to make sure that you can jump out of the abstraction and basically implement whatever needs to uh, be implemented, and it all uh, still knit together nicely. Uh, but that's still okay. Like you know, like 99% of the work was still un done automatically. We don't do, uh, we don't worry about doing a small bit on the side. So. Excuse me a moment. Um, so at a very high level, this is basically then what we're doing when we're constructing a solver. Is uh, so say when when I say well a user here, I would view Adrian as a user. So when I talk about user, I, I like I, like Adrian is my user. He's an application developer. Okay. Um, so what the, what the application developer is going to do is uh, consider your PDEs, be able to write them down and decide what, the, what type of discretization is going to be applied to this, so like finite difference, like you know, uh, fourth order in space, fourth order in time, or whatever, uh, details of the boundary conditions, details of the grid size and everything else. But these are things then that just form a specification. Um, so you haven't actually uh, written much in the line of code. And then after that, what's inside the red block there, that's to all intents and purposes, that's the compiler. Okay, it's a, it's a, but importantly, it's a source to source compiler. So what it's doing is it's taking that specification, it knows, okay, this is what a finite difference code should look like, and it just starts, uh, it just starts generating the code and uh, filling in the blanks to construct the whole thing. Uh, I'll explain more detail. And then the important thing then is, um, so Adrian here, like your application developer, this, this never changes. So even as you go across to the other side here, so you might have a back end here that's generating C++ code, with OpenMP, whatever, you might actually decide that you want to, well, someone has written a fancy new uh, stencil compiler, well, you can just write out uh, a DSL just targeting that stencil compiler, or whatever there is tomorrow. Like, I think you always have to have an ETC here, because, like, every time you think you've got it right, like, then uh, another year of research comes along and someone comes up with something new and cool, uh, uh, that ideally you would like to try and exploit, and you would try to, to be able to use, you just don't want to have to rewrite a half a million lines of code to do that. And I guess uh, a point that I want to make here then as well, just because I haven't got a specific slide for this later, is you, you also have got the, the, the notion now of separation of concerns. So I think in, the, in design theory, like separation of concerns is a very important concept, and it largely means that whoever your specialist is, everyone can, your specialist can work at their area of expertise, and get on and make progress, and they're not necessarily, um, they're not being slowed down or hampered, or there's no crosstalk with other areas. So once again here, like where you have your application developer there, they can make changes to their code, and they can be developing it, and they're not influenced by what happens on this side. So on this side, you have got uh, computer scientists who know nothing about the PDs or anything else. They've just got a specification written in an abstract way that they can reason about. And then they can knock themselves out. If a new processor comes along or new techniques come along that they want to try out, they can quite happily just start generating new code for that. Uh, it can be used then in the real code and nothing over on the other side needs to change. I, I get one of the main reasons I'm emphasizing that is because I think historically, I think we've all been a bit traumatized about, like it doesn't work just dropping a CS person into the middle of a physics code and expect them to make progress. It doesn't really, it, it, it doesn't really, well, experience shows it doesn't really work out well, usually. Um, how am I doing for time? Doing okay, yeah. Okay, so then uh, one bit, okay, so he, the here are the components, so one part is the kernel, so just let's focus on this for a, for a second. So what I describe here is the kernel is just, okay, you've chosen your discretization, what that, whatever that is. So you have your PDE, you have your discretization, uh, and largely the, the implementation task here is to generate the, the expressions that you're actually going to put in the middle of a loop, okay? So kernel is whatever goes into the, nest, the middle of a nested loop. Um, so the, the way that we dealt with this then is we fixed on using uh, SymPy for doing this. So Sym SymPy is... is um, like it was only developed over the last 10 years. I can't remember exactly when it started off. It was originally a Google uh, Summer of Code uh, project. 
Uh, but the nice thing about it is, well, it's based in Python, so it's very easy to develop in, and it gives you a very elegant way to write down all your mathematics, uh, like symbolically, and then you can start manipulating your equations quite easily. Um, so this, in terms of people then wanting to play around with their digitalizations and play around with their equations, it becomes, uh, it, like it becomes an easy task then, rather than trying to scratch things out on paper and then trying to transcribe that um, into source code. So one of the nice things this gives us is not just about, uh, it's not just about automating the process, but it also gives you uh, a systematic way where you can derive the computational kernels uh, directly from the governing equations. Um, so I think so. There's a lot of side benefits uh, on this, like increasing productivity, uh, enabling rapid development. Like it, it doesn't it doesn't require a whole new PhD student to implement a different uh, uh, equation. Uh, like and it reduces errors and bugs because like you've re removed an awful lot of uh, human effort here. I think the thing to remember is it's quite amazing like how big these lines get, and uh, your your mind does shut down after a while after you get through the the tint line of an expression and some part of a stencil. So the fact that this is all uh, done automatically, it's good. And then you can just, uh, you, it also allows you then to have um, a lot of test coverage. You can program in tests to make sure that nothing funny has happened and you're solving things the way that you expected them to. So at this point then as well, so in terms of, uh, SimPy is a very well, well designed because, uh, well, you can, um, there's a the code generation class that you can go and specialize yourself if you want. If you want to target a particular language, you just go in, edit it, and then it just it, it takes that expression and just writes it out in, what, in the syntax, whatever language you're interested in. Um, you can also quite easily do like various transformations of that. Like if you want to expand it, evaluate some constants, uh, manipulate it, you can do all of do that and then just write out the code at the end. Um, yeah, and I guess I'm just re-emphasizing this point again. Like, it, this is a real, it's not just an accuracy thing, and product, it's, it's, it's a fundamentally a, 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 pr a productivity issue. Uh, once again, because we are interested in more and more complex problems, and the cognitive load just associated with reading the one line of an expression of an update becomes uh, quite difficult. Like, I guess I'm going back to the point again that no more than the, the people doing the harvest at the beginning. Like finite element is pretty straightforward. Like this is the kind of stuff that people learn in the first year uh, undergraduate. Uh, like, you know, PhD students and like researchers shouldn't be spending years on end uh, rewriting this. Uh, now the second part of this then is more focusing on the loop control and what you need to do there. So there's a, there's a certain amount of um, sort of metaprogramming uh, happens here. So the, the first thing is, like, find a difference loops that are highly structured, and it's actually really well understood, well, it's pretty well understood how to optimize these codes. Uh, in, the, in the greater scheme of things, it is one of the easier things to optimize. Um, and, like, you've got various techniques, like you enforce uh, memory alignment, uh, so this is really important. Well, different types of alignment are important depending on what type of architecture you're on. Like, if you're on a regular UMA system, for example, you just have to have uh, cache line alignment. If you're on a NUMA system uh, where you've got multiple sockets, then you have to have like you know page alignment. Um, you have to apply first touch, like you know, all pretty standard stuff. Um, you also can guide uh, vectorization. So very often, um, uh, uh, people often miss this as well. Like they just compile with uh, like minus O3 or O4 on the Intel compiler. And then they just expect stuff to be vectorized. And very often it doesn't vectorize, and it can be for, for reasons that are not, like, uh, not immediately obvious or can be difficult to fix. Uh, but once again, because we abstract that out, we can just make sure that the right thing is done. Memory is initialized in a particular way, and it's defined in particular ways to make sure that vectorize does ha vectorization does happen. But then we can also, there's, there's all special types of pragmas then that you can add in before loops to actually instruct the compiler, say, well, yeah, you, you might know what you're doing, but we know what we're doing. Like, you have to go and vectorize this and help it along its way. Like, pe people expect an awful lot of magic from compilers, uh, and they're often upset when they discover there's actually no magic there. They actually can be quite dumb about what to do, so they need quite a, hel a lot of help uh, to move along. Uh, and as I said, po uh, polyhedral model for optimization, this is, this is probably one of the hottest areas, if you like, for getting this, uh, for optimizing these codes. Uh, and again, this is extremely tedious to implement by hand, and there's many, many conference papers that go on about people doing it by hand, but then, but the thing to recognize is that there's a whole community that generates tools to do this for you, 
And then typically then they link them up with auto-tuning techniques. So there's also auto-tuning libraries that try to uh, set a bunch of parameters, uh, once again, to maximize the performance. And um, so the way that we have implemented this then is that we're actually picked up on uh, Macul. So this is used in things like uh, Markdown and uh, worst terms you know there someplace. But like it, it, this is actually used uh, for lots of sort of web type applications. And but it's just a, it's just a it's just a template library. So you 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 define like in a, in a very easy way you define okay this is my generic uh, solver that I want and you have largely just added in keywords saying. Uh, here I've got my main velocity, here I got my main um, uh, stress, put a boundary condition here, and you end up like, then with a whole description of your solver that's just a few lines long, that's a template, and then the compiler takes over and, and it knows what it has to inject to each bit. And then this is where, you, beca because it's doing all of this programmatically, then you can start implementing all this funny stuff that, uh, that no sane human would uh, try to do by hand. Or if they do it by hand once, they'll never do it again, probably. Um, so this is when we get into the into the source source co compilation steps. So we load up that uh, uh, meta program. Uh, we use uh, SymPy. So like once again, like you know, your mathematician got to write down their maths equations like symbolically, and then all of the uh, additional work is done for them automatically. Uh, we initialize various variables. So then here you can start doing some aggressive optimizations as well. Like you would evaluate all constants, like if in terms of size of memory, just set the size of the memory. You wouldn't, um, so th these are known then at compile time, and the compiler then can uh, optimize again more aggressively. And uh, here is, so it's always good to remember this, this project is still actually quite a new project, a little over six months. So it's, um, it, it's a fast moving target. But at the moment, OpenMP is all fully implemented. Uh, vectorization, so that what I mean here is adding in all of the, the pragmas and all of the other magic you need to do to ensure vectorization. That's all complete. And uh, the main thing that we're working on, like these days, is, is uh, integrating polyhedral support. So that's to do for free all of the tiling and loop jam and uh, these other ones. Uh, we started looking at, at uh, Clang Poly for people that know things about this. Um, but it's actually a bit of a pain to integrate into something like this, but Pluto seems to do exactly what we want because it does uh, source, source transformations, which is what we need. And then finally then, you have, this is the thing to remember, you've generated native source code for your ta target architecture that you just pass on to a compiler, and then the compiler has an easy uh, job of doing the right thing. Um, I think I can skip over this maybe, like I'm just, this is largely just uh, like some, uh, like you know, picture, uh, pictures of the process I was just talking through. Um, so they're just going for the code to maths. It's actually quite nice as well, like I think, Pem, because I think even in terms of reporting and documentation, uh, like this is, a, this is a thing we're still uh, working out in terms of just getting the framework and the reporting right in that. But the nice thing is, because it's already been done up there in uh, SymPy, a lot of our maths are done on this, then like, you know, without any effort, we can uh, generate uh, equations in Markdown and for LaTeX, so we can generate reports like that's fully showing all of the equations that are solved for this, and it's all automated. So that's why it's nice. Um, so here, like the, the real sort of eagle-eyed among you would have noticed that there's a lot of uh, constants in there that should have been evaluated. Like, you know, that's all, like, so this expression actually looks rubbish, but once again, so th th that's because the slide is a bit old, but once again, that's only you change one line in SymPy, and then it just gets uh, all expanded and reevaluated in a totally different way. But once again, then it, it takes one second to do, as opposed to um, half an hour or something rearranging the code. Um, now, they did this slide, uh, Okay, I think strictly speaking, this slide should not be necessary to put in here. Um, like, I think if you were following carefully everything that happened. But I think my experience is that, um, like, like, this is quite new. Like, there's still very few people that do stuff like code generation in uh, engineering and science. There is groups that do it, but it's not so common. Uh, and so frequently, people don't get it at the beginning. So, like, very common question I get is, well, you're doing this in Python. Like, Python's going to be really, really slow. Um, so the first thing that you need to, well, I hope it's clear then from the talk that you're not running Python, at least not in any of the performance critical parts of this, and you're actually generating native source code that's compiled. Um, 
so there's no issue like that. Um, we may use Python, like say, like uh, we were obviously planning to take the project forward, and like P Python is certainly there as an option in terms of acting as a glue layer. Uh, but once again, it's not performance critical. Uh, as long as it doesn't occur in any performance critical bit, then you care much, much more about productivity and being easily able to express stuff and solve stuff than uh, worrying about marginal performance issues. And uh, ultimately, the first, the, the, the ultimately, what you always have to do is uh, stop speculating about uh, performance and actually just stick it into a profiler like VTune and then you can actually measure uh, measure exactly what the bottleneck is uh, rather than speculating about it. But it, I, I think it's worth re-emphasizing that particular point. Um, so the next question, so I think this is, this is important for a whole set of reasons, uh, but performance, what does success look like? It's, it's very hard to figure out well, should I be putting more work into this? Like, is it going to go any faster? Should I really burn an extra year of my life trying to go to make this thing go faster? Uh, is it possible to make it go faster? So I think what you, what you need to do, and I think this is increasingly becoming a dogma now. I think a, a short time ago, people they really didn't have to do this. Uh, but now people are becoming a lot more insistent and a lot more savvy about this. But I think you really have to create some type of uh, computational model to actually model about, uh, like, what's your expectation? How fast can this go? So if you do everything perfectly, what is the peak performance possible given an algorithm and given a particular bit of architecture? Um, so this, uh, this can be quite a long exercise to go through. Um, one, one of the reasons, and like even for our own graphs, so I have to actually, when I'm uh, in a few slides later, I have to go and point out some corrections that we have made because literally we were, up in we were updating this even today as we're going through this. I think it's very easy to get wrong, but it's a very important process to do um, so you know exactly uh, how much more you can gain from just doing uh, coding optimizations. This also tells you then, once you have maximized that, you know that you're using the processor to the full capacity. If your code is still not going fast enough for practical purposes, then you know you have to actually be researching something different. For example, changing your merger algorithms or whatever. So, so it's a good way then of actually quanti uh, uh, like being able to uh, quantify in some way what your research strategy should be, uh, rather than uh, just arguing about it. Okay, so this is, uh, let me try and explain this to you. So what the roofline model is, is on this axis here, we have our uh, single, uh, single precision performance. Uh, across here then we have our operational intensity, so this is basically how many operations are you executing? Um, uh, like, are you executing per per access to main memory? Um, now, this red line here, then, so that you can see then why it's called roof line. So, this red line here, this is pretty much what you calculate off the specification manual for the processor. Um, you're calculating this from the from the clock speed and from the mem from the memory bandwidth. Um, so you, you know that you can't transfer, like from the manual, you know that uh, data doesn't move any faster than this. Um, and then this is the achieved benchmark then is always going to be slightly less than this. And like th this is a standard way of measuring that using the streamlined benchmark. Mm -hmm. um, so what you know then is you can't, th 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 this forms, if you like, a barrier that you can't go above. So no matter what you implement, this is the maximum performance of the machine. Um, so the trick here is first of all to figure out what your operation intensity is, and to set this at the proper level, and then you go up and you inter interact with you, you intersect with your green axis, then you go across here and you can say, well, this is the theoretical uh, maximum performance that can be achieved given that processor, and then you see, okay, then this is our actual, this is what we measure that we have achieved, and the distance between what you have achieved and what you could um, in principle achieve that tells you like how much you could possibly get out of just optimizing your code. Um, so like according to Intel, if you, if you look at the um, like, uh, pearls of uh, parallelism, uh, I forget off, uh, offhand the exact title of the book, um, but basically brought up by the Intel engineers telling you how to optimize your code, like they pretty much say like if you, want, if you get 60% of the theoretical maximum performance, then your job is done. So that's more or less what we're aiming for. Now, So this, in our case, so this is our roofline model uh, for the Intel uh, Xeon. So this is uh, running at Sinai. And for the isotropic elastic wave equation, so we just set up a verification problem where we're propagating uh, eigenmode. And the, the, 
So this, so this is something we're actively working on. I was checking my email to see if Felipe had any update for me today. And this is actually disturbing me for quite a bit because I was trying to figure out what's gone wrong here. Because a lot of this is based on estimates uh, because we're still trying to instrument the code. And one thing that I figured out, so a correction that I just want to make uh, live on shows where, is we had estimated that the aerometric intensity was here. So then I was actually quite depressed because then that gave us a uh, maximum uh, theoretical performance of just over 128. And then I was like, you know, really depressed that we were just over like 32, close on to 40 here. And it actually turned out that the mistake was that, um, what's this line here? It actually turns out that that actually should have been 0.5, which brings us up here. So we don't have that much. So that distance here then, this is going to be the, well, what we hope is going to be the, maybe the polyhedral uh, type optimizations. But the polyhedral type optimizations will probably do two things. It'll probably move uh, this line over here a bit and then raise this and then. But you can see what the game becomes then. You now have, you have, now have a model. You know exactly what's wrong, where you see the lines are. You can actually figure out what it is you're supposed to be optimizing. And importantly then, you know when you should stop optimizing. Uh, so there's going to be a very clear point at which we say, okay, that works, we can leave it alone, and then let's move on to solving uh, some other aspect of the problem, like it's going to be I.O. is going to, uh, for checkpointing and these types of issues. That'll be the other uh, big one, obviously. So this is quite useful. So we're getting there. Oh, but the way that we're going to fix this, so the way that that error crept in, and like it was a bit of a pain because to be honest with you, we were trying to do it like you know quick and dirty. So I'd have a nice uh, pretty picture for the conference, but quick and dirty like normally doesn't work out. Um, but then going back into the design philosophy as well, uh, what we're working on at the moment is um, like direct measurements using so Pathy is is this library it's used for looking at the actual hardware counters associated with the architecture, so it can get precise measurements, and then that actually becomes integrated with the whole lot. And then you actually get uh, like a very a very rigorous uh, measure of what the performance is, your roof line model, and then you know that that's accurate and reliable. So uh, uh, yet another human element uh, removed from this. We've also got this running on the on the Phi. So I think it's it's mostly uh, Sinai that was pushing a lot of development in the Phi, getting everything up and running and uh, profiled. Uh, this, the exact same mistake is made here, okay? So this graph isn't as, is, as bad as it initially looks. And so this uh, vertical line here should actually be going through 0.5. So we're interacting there. So we should be getting, like, say, maybe around 70 or that. We're actually achieving around 40, but so we know where we need to work to make this go faster. Um, so I'm reasonably happy with this. Um, and this is, uh, so th 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 this is something similar, so this is just showing the gigaflops uh, for the Intel Xeon and the Intel uh, Xeon Phi. So that error that was in the pre previous graph is irrelevant here, so th this number is actually accurate. Um, so what this is here, the reference was basically the isotropic elastic code, like say with the stagger grid, like the Graves paper, implemented with OpenMP by like a HPC expert. So like it was, it was pretty well written by, ha like by hand in the first instance, so it was a reasonable uh, reference point. Um, but it didn't have, uh, it didn't have uh, SIMD vectorization. Like it didn't have any the enhancements to enforce that type of stuff. And then the generated code then, so this is when we were actually using all of our ab abstractions and all of our automated stuff, including the vectorization. Um, so this code tells quite a nice story then because uh, we can see on the Xeon, it nearly doubles the performance. Uh, on the Phi then, it's not as much, uh, but it's still, it's still quite good. It's, it's still, um, I, 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 like in, in terms of what people normally show at conferences, they would definitely be very happy showing a plot like this at a conference, uh, but we can push it a bit more. That said, I think like going back, I, I think every time, every time I talk to uh, Mike Warner about this problem, I get more and more worried about, oh no, what are we going to have to do next? Because like I think that the, the lesson here that is still quite interesting. That um, okay, doing everything right, yeah, you might double the performance, but I think this always reminds you that you have to go back and look at the numerics because doubling the performance is probably not going to be enough for where we actually really need to get to. 
However, now that we have, we have got a whole framework for just generating the code, we can quickly experiment with these different numerical algorithms and different approaches and just basically try everything and see what works. But then it, it, it becomes a tractable problem. So you can experiment. It takes an afternoon. It's not going to, um, it's not going to be a few years endeavor. Um, so this is just comments. Um, like I could go into more detail in this, but I, I think largely you probably picked up you probably picked up already. But the, probably this is the most thing I'm obsessing about at the moment. This is the most thing that's likely to get uh, uh, to get optimizations. And given now that we know that that, the, that vertical line is across here, that we're close to getting peak, pretty much I think when we get polyhedral uh, support in there, then we're finished with the optimization part of it from the pure performance, and then we're going to look back at the numerics again. Um, so what I see as um, uh, ongoing and future work, uh, to, to a large extent, my biggest motivation for, for turning up in, uh, in Natal this week uh, wasn't just for the fantastic weather and the nice food. Uh, but it's largely as well to uh, get with the community to actually figure out what is the optimal uh, problem to start next. Uh, like I say, the next bit of work, bit pieces of work that we need to do with this framework are relatively straightforward. Uh, we have to do a bit of hardening in the API so that it can be integrated with FWI codes. I know, Felix, this is something that we talked about before, that we had to sit down to actually write what an API would look like, a useful API would look for. So a lot of this then is about hardening, okay, like this, this now should be start being used um, and do the various tidying up associated with that. Uh, I mentioned polyhedra already. Uh, a bit further analysis just to make sure that we are, uh, we're reaching the 60%. So we want to confirm those results and that, w that we are happy that uh, it's optimized enough from that perspective. Um, and then the other, the other area, I haven't, I'm not talking about it today. I, I can talk about it over beer or like I think we talk about it later in the week is that we're also looking at uh, unstructured mesh methods. So there's a whole, c it, there's a whole set of other uh, numerical algorithms that we can assess, like spectral element methods, where we can try to exploit other numerics to see if there's anything to be gained. Uh, but that, uh, that also uh, uh, exploits um, code generation. But that's a whole other talk, as I said. And I guess, uh, finally, if you're, if you're interested in following the project, um, I say it's uh, opeshi.org, um, like it's funded by Intel. So as I said, it's between Sinai and ourselves at Imperial. Uh, it's a it's an open so it's actually an open source project, and it's an industrial friendly open source project. Um, so we're ver we're uh, we welcome people to get involved um, and collaborate with us on it. Or if you want to try and uh, use it in your code, we'd be very healthy to help you uh, try it out in your code. And I think that's pretty much all I want to say about this. I, I think I'd prefer to move on to discussion. And I'm equally ha and keep the discussion open. I'm equally happy to switch over between talking about like you know the data aspect of this, uh, as opposed to the compute aspect of it, because I think that's one area I'd like to move into next.